Okay, and welcome back students who are taking uh, financial accounting. And in this series of videos, we are working on the theory videos for chapter seven um, for cash and receivables. And as you saw, I just changed the, the number to two because this is the second video. Um, in the first video, we had talked about uh, sales, purchases, and the payment process and the bank reconciliation. And I had said that we'll make uh, separate videos uh, going forward for the direct write-off method, allowance method, and then for the percent of sales method and the aging method instead of trying to combine them all together. And so in this video, we're going to talk about the direct write-off method. And um, let me get there. Okay, so, um, you know, the direct write-off method. Well, what we're doing here is, is we have our accounts receivable, okay? And what happens when, you know, the that person, I mean, you're extending the credit to them and they're not going to pay, right? Like they go out of business or whatever have you, and you no longer collect that money. Well, you know, that's sitting in your accounts receivable account, right? And if you're not going to receive it, you know, it doesn't belong there anymore. So you have to get it off of your books. Now, different businesses, um, you know, I mean, businesses are in different sizes, I mean, if you're a small business where you have 30, 40, 50, 100 customers, okay, it's easy for you to be able to see which customers are going to pay and are not going to pay. Okay, um, you know, you you'll have your accounts receivable subsidiary aging report, which shows how much the customers owe. You know, how much are due in 30 days, and 60 days, 90 days, over 120 days. And when they're in that 120 day column, you know, I'm sure you're, you know, calling them up um, saying, hey, where's our money? And you're getting a good feel for whether you're going to get paid or not on those accounts receivables. Um, if you know that they're not going to be paid, then they don't belong on your books. So you have to take them off your books. And that's where the direct write off method comes in because you're immediately directly writing them off. OK, um, you know exactly which one. Right. So what happens is at the end of the accounting period, um, you're, you look at the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger, and you have you know the different customer names, and you have the one to thirty day column, you know thirty to sixty, sixty to ninety, oops, uh, the sixty to ninety day column, you know ninety to one hundred. 90 to 120 and then of course over 120 and you can see what customers owe what in those periods of time and if you're in this 120 day over 120 day column and you know that John Doe was not going to pay you you know the $300 you're going to have to write that off okay so now let's go back and let's just quickly talk about how the you know the sales are recorded and let's use T accounts in order to be able to see this Remember, when you make the sale, you're debiting and you're making on account, you're debiting the accounts receivable for John Doe, okay, for $300. And you're crediting your revenue account, whatever that is, for the $300, okay? So you have your uh, accounts receivable general ledger account here, all right? And when you post this transaction, you're posting it to your uh, general ledger accounts receivable, and so it goes on the debit side. But remember that whenever you um, have a journal entry that you're affecting accounts receivable, you actually have to put it in two places. The first place you're going to put it is in the general ledger account itself. The second place you're going to put it is in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Okay. Remember the subsidiary ledger is the detail. Okay. For what is in the, the general ledger the actual general ledger accounts receivable account and the total balance of the subsidiary ledger should be the same as that you know accounts receivable account so let's just say um, you know I have John Doe for 300 and let's say let me erase some of this here and try to write it in in here so let's say I have John Doe here for 300 and I have Betty Smith for 200 and I have Tom Jones for say 150 okay so the total in your subsidiary ledger account should be $650 right that's the total balance of everybody that owes you money um, 
is in this case here uh, 650. In your general ledger account, you you know because whenever you use it, you make it a journal entry and you're posting it in the, the same two places, well your accounts receivable general ledger account should have the same balance as your subsidiary ledger account. In this case here, six hundred and fifty dollars. Now. Uh, John Doe is not going to pay this 300 this 300 dollars here okay and you decide to write it off well this is where the direct write-off method comes in at the end of the accounting period as part of the closing process remember the closing process for when you're closing the accounting period is to make sure that the balances in your accounts are correct in order to be able to create your financial statements so as part of the process you have to take a look at your accounts receivable accounts and determine which ones you know that you're actually going to write off because you're not getting that money back you know you're not you're not going to receive that money um, f from that sale so you go through your subsidiary ledger and say okay this one this one this one have to be written off well in this case here we're writing off you know John Doe's right because we know we're not going to get this three hundred dollars back so in order to do that we have to of course reduce our accounts receivable because we have to take it off so we have to make an adjusting journal entry this is part of the adjusting process when uh, at the end of the accounting period so what do we do well if I had a debit to accounts receivable to take it off that means I have to credit my accounts receivable to for John Doe for three hundred dollars and since debits have to equal credits I'm going to debit bad debt expense for the 300 okay so when I actually post that to the general ledger account I'm going to end up posting the $300 as a credit here all right and that means my balance now in my general ledger account is only 350 okay but remember you have to post it in two places you're not only posting it into the general ledger account but you're also posting it up here into the subsidiary ledger which means uh, John Doe, you know, he has a, a balance of zero, and the balance in your subsidiary ledger account is not 650; it ends up being 350 dollars. Okay, so it matches. So when you get to the end of the accounting period, as part of the closing process, you have to look at your accounts receivable to make sure that it's accurate as to what people owe you. And if somebody is not going to pay and you decide that you're never going to receive it, you have to get it off your books. Okay. And also part of it is, is that you have to make sure that um, the balance in your general ledger account, right? This is your general ledger account, is the same as the balance in your subsidiary ledger. Okay. If they're not, then that means you made a mistake somewhere. Most likely you didn't post an entry in both places like you're supposed to. But that, you know, looking at your subsidiary ledger and your general ledger and making sure that, you know, you're reconciling it to the same balance, that's all part of that closing process. And of course, writing off, you know, bad debt is also, you know, making sure that your accounts receivable is correct. Okay. So now you're sitting here and you have this here. Um, uh, balance of $350 in your account, right? And let's just say that this happened in the month of January, right? So this is January's work, right? Well, you know, now when at the end of January, okay, that, uh, you know, John Doe doesn't owe you the $300 at zero now. That's his balance in that account. Now, let's say we come to June, all right? And in June, John Doe comes back to you and says, hey, look, I know I owed you $300. I was having a tough time, blah, 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 blah. You know, I want to uh, pay the, you know, the $300 because I, I still want to do business with you. Okay. And so you say, okay, I mean, obviously you're not going to turn away the $300, right? So what do you have to do? All right. Because now you actually, you know, you know, you're being reimbursed, you know, you're, you're being compensated the way you're supposed to so you have to be able to get this back on the books so what do you do well you have to go and you say okay what was my adjusting journal entry and I have to reverse it well to reverse it right here's the entry to reverse it I'm going to debit my accounts receivable for John Doe for 300 and I'm going to credit my bad debt expense 
for 300. Okay, so what did, uh, you know, when you post that, that journal entry to your ledger account, okay, um, now you've put the $300 back on on the debit side, okay, and for John Doe, you've now put the $300 back on to the subsidiary ledger. So now your subsidiary ledger has a balance of 650 and the balance in your general ledger account is $650 again also. So now that receivable is back on, all right, and now he's going to pay it. You know, obviously he gives you the money, so what do you do for that? Well, you're going to debit your cash for the 300 and then you're going to credit your accounts receivable again to John Doe, right, for 300 right? Now when you go and you post this entry, again, you're going to post this accounts receivable, right? You have to post it in two places, so um, it's a credit for 300 under the receivable, and you're paying off that $300 in your subsidiary ledger. So now the balance in your subsidiary ledger goes back down to 350 Okay, and the balance in your um, your ledger account is not 650; it is 350 dollars. So they're still the same. You know, you added the receivable on, and then you you know you took it off because you're receiving payment in cash. Now, if you take a good look at this, you can say, you say to yourself, well, why would I make these two different entries, okay, when I have a debit here to accounts receivable and a credit to accounts receivable, they wash each other out. Why don't I just make a debit to cash and a credit to bad debt, right? Bad debt, D-E-B-T, uh, bad debt expense. Okay, why don't I just make that one entry instead of making these two entries? Well, the reason why you don't do that is because, I mean, sure, you know who John Doe is, okay? Um, but you want to leave a, a trail of, of transactions, okay? Um, part of that, you know, the transaction is is that, you know, he says I'm going to uh, pay off, you know, that account's receivable. Well, the transaction is that I have to reverse that entry to put it back for me to be able to, to write it off. And that allows a paper trail. Now, remember, you know who John Doe is. But if an auditor comes in and he looks at the books and he says, okay, I see this you know, debit to cash and a credit to bad debt expense, and that's the net effect, that's fine. But why are you doing that? You know, um, you know where does it show that John Doe is you know you're he's paying off his three hundred dollars that was previously written off way back in January and this is June okay so you have to you know you're uh, you put it on your books as an entry and then you take it off your books when when you pay it in cash okay so that there's a, a trail for somebody to come in and be able to look at it and go okay I know why that happened the net effect still ends up being this transaction okay but the difference being is is that you, you know, you can see what happened with John Doe, and of course, you might make you know an uh, an explanation. You know, write a description as part of that journal entry to say uh, to reinstate John Doe's uh, accounts receivable balance in anticipation of payment uh, for that accounts receivable. And then, of course, when he make when you he actually you post the uh, the payment for the cash, you know, um, you know that washes off the accounts receivable. So uh, the direct method is, you know, I know this screen looks a little sloppy right now, but the reality is, is that um, when it comes to uh, the direct method, you know, you're, you know, you're just going to look at your subsidiary ledger and say, okay, which ones um, are not going, you know, we're never going to collect that money. And so you have to, you're going to make the journal entry to credit the accounts receivable, to take it off of the accounts receivable, and you're moving it to the bad debt expense, okay? And that's directly written off. Okay? And most, and you know, and it's rare that somebody actually comes back and says, "Hey, I'm going to pay my bad debt." Okay? I mean, it does happen, all right? And that's why I went through this additional explanation. But it, it's rare that happens. Generally. You know, it's as simple as saying, okay, this person's not going to pay, this person's not going to pay, um, you know, 
uh, and I'm just going to directly take that off and put it to the bad debt expense. Okay. All right, so that's it. And in the next video, we will cover the allowance method, um, which is a different, you know, a different way of looking at uh, writing off your bad debt. Um, remember, the direct method works best when you have a smaller business and you only have like, you know, 30, 50, 100, you know, customers where you can identify each and every one. But what happens when you're the credit card company? You know, when you've got tens of thousands of customers, you're not looking at each and every individual one and writing each and every, uh, you know, making, you know, uh, a thousand entries, you know, at the end of the accounting period. Um, that's just not efficient. And that's where the allowance method comes in. So um, we'll discuss that in the next video.